Okay, hello and welcome to another tutorial video. We're going to go into a slightly more technical topic this time and discuss the return on invested capital, also known as the ROIC. And obviously with this type of topic, you can easily find definitions online, you can find plenty of Investopedia articles, but I wanna go beyond that here and answer a different question, which is, is ROIC actually useful in financial models and valuations? And if so, why do many bankers and bank style models completely ignore this or maybe just put it in as an afterthought? So if you want this tutorial in writing and you want the screenshots, the PDFs, the Excel examples and all of that, you can go to this URL, go to our knowledge base, financial statement analysis, and then ROIC dash return dash on dash invested dash capital. I will link to it below and pin it as the first comment here so you can easily click on it and find everything by following this. As usual, I'm gonna give you the short answer in about three minutes, and then if you want more detail, you can keep watching. Return on invested capital is defined as a company's net operating profit after taxes divided by its average invested capital. So net operating profit after taxes might be over a quarter or a year or six months, and you have to take the average of the invested capital because this is a balance sheet based metric. And when you pair a balance sheet metric with an income statement metric, you wanna average out the balance sheet since it shows you a snapshot in time. NOPAT is defined as operating income times one minus the tax rate. Pretty simple, you're just taking the EBIT or operating income and then adjusting it for the taxes. And then invest capital is defined as the debt and equity on a company's balance sheet. So the book values or face values, not the market values. And then you add any other long-term funding sources some of this can get a little bit tricky, which is why I have a footnote here at the bottom. We'll address some of these issues later. ROIC tells you how efficiently a company is using all of its capital from all different sources, outside shareholders, lenders, internally generated capital from its own operations to generate after-tax profits. If two companies are similar, but one company has a higher return on invested capital, the company with a higher return on invested capital should, in theory, trade at a higher valuation multiple or higher valuation multiples in general. So let's go into Excel and do a quick calculation using my favorite examples here for Best Buy and Target. I've pulled in some of the information from both companies' filings here just to save us a bit of time. A lot of this comes from our tutorial on EBITDA, actually, so you can refer to that. To calculate EBIT, we start with operating income on the income statement. In our opinion, there are no non-recurring charges for either company here. So for EBIT, we can just add up our operating income. And then for net operating profit after taxes, we take the EBIT or operating income, we multiply by one minus the tax rate right here. This tax rate is based on an average of their tax rates over the past three years prior to this tutorial. For the invested capital, we took their debt from the balance sheet, which was listed in a couple different spots, and their shareholders equity, they don't have preferred stock, and for now, we're just ignoring lease liabilities in cash. We can add these up to get to invested capital. And then for return on invested capital, you wanna take the NOPAT in this period and then divide by the average invested capital because this tells you the amount of capital that they're earning these after-tax profits on. It happens over a period, so you wanna use the average right here. And so we have that. These ROIC numbers are very high, especially when you look at the much lower numbers for target, but we'll get into some of the reasons for that in a little bit. What's also weird here is that despite the much higher ROIC numbers, Best Buy actually trades at lower valuation multiples than Target, which could be a sign that we might need to adjust the calculation or maybe look at this differently, or maybe that Best Buy is undervalued and Target is overvalued, but we need more information to look into that. In financial models, you can use ROIC to send the check your assumptions in something like a three statement model, a DCF or an LBO, and see if something like a higher exit multiple is justified. So I'm gonna pull up this simple LBO model. We have assumed the same purchase and exit multiple 12X EBITDA in each case. And if you go down to the bottom of this, you can see that the return on invested capital rises from 4% to 9%. And what this tells us is that we are being a little bit conservative here because the growth rate also falls from 10% to 5%, but we could make a case that the EBITDA exit multiple should be a little bit higher here because the return on invested capital improves over time. Even though ROIC is useful, it also has problems. It's defined inconsistently, it's less meaningful for some companies and industries, and it's not always practical to include in a quick model because you have to project the debt and equity balances. So that's the short version. Let's go into a slightly longer version now. So I'm gonna start with the ROIC calculations for Target and Best Buy. I've already shown you an example, but I want to explain some of the nuances there. Then we'll go into ROIC and LBO and TCF models, and then I'll explain some of the issues with ROIC and how you can use it or not use it in models.
With the ROIC calculations, the basic definition is pretty simple. It's operating income times one minus the tax rate over the average invested capital. Where the nuances creep in are in a few places. First off, which non-recurring charges do you add back to calculate operating income or EBIT? Now we covered this topic in the EBITDA tutorial previously, so I would recommend taking a look at that. In short, we recommend being pretty conservative with this and not adding back a whole lot unless something really stands out as a true non-recurring charge that has only happened once in the past five or 10 years or something like that. For the tax rate, we prefer to use the simple historical average over the past three to five years if there haven't been any major changes in that time frame. If you get something like a negative 20% or 75% tax rate, then maybe you just use the corporate statutory tax rate in the company's country. And then we get a lot of questions about invested capital. What about leases? What about cash? Some people subtract cash in this calculation. What do you recommend doing? The short answer here is that we tend not to subtract cash in the ROIC calculation. If you want to do it, you can, but you need to apply it consistently for all the companies in your set. We don't like doing this because sometimes it can artificially inflate the ROIC numbers. With leases, if it's a US-based company, we prefer not to add lease liabilities to invested capital because if we do that, we then have to adjust EBIT by adding back the rental expense that corresponds to this lease liability. So it adds some extra work here and it doesn't necessarily improve things. Now, if it's an IFRS based company, you could add back the lease depreciation to EBIT since all international companies record their lease expense split into interest and depreciation. You have to make some adjustments here. So you can add this to EBIT and you can add the lease liabilities to invested capital. Or another option is to simply not add the lease liabilities to invested capital and then just deduct the lease interest from EBIT. So you will have to make some adjustments there, but this is our preferred treatment for US-based companies. If we go back and look at these calculations in a bit more detail, so if we go back to this model, we can actually make some adjustments for these issues with lease and, leases and cash. So for example, down here, I have the lease and cash adjusted ROIC for Best Buy, but in some ways this makes the numbers even more nonsensical because now we go from an ROIC of 30, 40, 45 or 46% all the way up to more like 60 to 90%, which is so high that you almost can't even take it seriously. If you look at the numbers for Target, the lease and cash adjusted ROIC is definitely higher. We go from 20 to 26% to more like 23 to 31% in the first two years. One thing we could do here to make this a little bit more normal is to actually just ignore cash. So we can add back the rental expense as part of this lease adjustment. We can add the lease liabilities, but then in the calculation, we can just ignore this deduction for cash down here. And then we get a lease adjusted ROIC that is still higher for Best Buy, 30 to 40%, but not dramatically higher. It's more like 20 to 25% range for Target. And this might be the best way to do it overall for comparability purposes. Now, in terms of ROIC in other types of models, as I said, the main function is to send the check your work and make sure your long-term forecast makes sense. So if you're assuming a higher exit multiple in a three statement model or an LBO model, is the company's ROIC also increasing? I'm going to pull up this example for Kohl's, this Australian grocery company here, where we have an increasing EBITDA multiple. We buy the company, a minority stake in the company for around 10 X EBITDA, but then we assume a sale in the future for more like 11 to 12 X EBITDA. And you might look at this and think it's too aggressive, but they're, ROIC or return on capital as they label it goes up from around 15% to 20%. So if you think about it, something like this, it's about a 33% increase going from 10 X to 12 X may actually be reasonable because they are becoming more efficient and their return on invested capital is increasing over time. If you have something that doesn't make sense, so maybe the ROIC is staying the same, but the exit multiple is increasing. You may have to revisit your assumptions. And if you're looking at a DCF, generally speaking, you want the ROIC to decline and move closer to the weighted average cost of capital by the time you get to the terminal period. No company in the terminal period should really have an ROIC that is far ahead of the WAC in that terminal period. And it should really be a constant difference by the time you get to that point. Let's talk about some issues with ROIC and its use in models now. I mentioned before that in a lot of banking style models, you won't see this. Many bankers don't even bother with this metric. The first issue is that there are some inconsistent definitions and calculations and different companies also calculated differently. So I'm gonna pull up Target's filings here where they have their own calculation and they're doing things somewhat differently. They do add debt 
So we agree with that. And they do add shareholders equity, but they also add operating lease liabilities and they subtract their cash and cash equivalents. Other companies would do this differently. You will see variations where they add all these liabilities, where they don't subtract cash, where they do subtract cash. They also attempt to make their own adjustments for EBIT and NOPAT here. So there are many variations. And because of these inconsistencies, it's not always the easiest metric to use. Another issue is that ROIC is most meaningful for large, mature companies. And it's not relevant for high growth companies, for tech or biotech startups. And in a lot of industries, you simply don't look at it or pay that much attention to it because you care more about things like the expected growth rates and margins. Another issue is that if you just have a simple cash flow only model, such as one of our simple DCF or LBO models, you will have to put in some extra work because you have to forecast the debt and equity to use ROIC and to look at it over the future. And then one final issue is that in investment banking, the client may not actually care that you're using assumptions that make sense. And in investment banking, you always do what the client wants because they're paying you. So it may not actually matter all that much. And it could be more of an issue if you're looking at something critically in a buy side role, such as at a hedge fund, an asset management firm, or private equity. So that's it for this tutorial. Let's do a quick recap and summary. ROIC calculations for Target and Best Buy. Operating income times one minus the tax rate over the average invested capital. There is a question over what to use for invested capital, and I showed you a few variations here, but I think the simplest one is the standard definition you see everywhere. You could adjust for leases as we did here, but I don't always think it's necessary. In LBO and DCF models, ROIC is more of a sendy check than anything, and it lets you check to make sure that your assumptions into the terminal period and your exit assumptions for an LBO, the exit multiple versus the purchase multiple make sense. And then finally, the issues with ROIC. Inconsistent definitions, different companies do it differently. It may require extra work if you have a very simple model. And in a lot of cases, if you're working for a client in banking or a related role, they don't really care if your assumptions make intuitive sense. They just want a certain result and they're paying you for that. That's about it for this tutorial. Hopefully now you have a better sense of what return on invested capital means, how to calculate it, and how to use it in financial models.